So uh, I start recording. I think we can start today class. <clears throat> so as we started with uh, this five minutes delay, we will uh, uh, conclude our class today at two o'clock. Uh, well, we are talking about uh, the, the non-equilibrium flows that we, we, we can see in our rockets. Uh, as we were discussing before, the upper and lower boundary, uh, let's say, for the possible criteria to study the expansion process. So we refer to the equilibrium expansion to the frozen expansion as these two band boundaries. And in particular, the first boundary, the equilibrium expansion, is optimistic because uh, we imagine with that approximation that the whole amount of heat which is absorbed by endothermic reaction is then released during the expansion process at the temperature decreases. On the other hand, on the other extreme, we consider the frozen flow assumption that corresponds to the fact that any heat uh, subtracted to the uh, combustion products from endothermic reaction is not released because we have no recombination reaction, no, uh, let's say, shift of the equilibrium possibly with heat release. Uh, after that, after discussing this, we uh, highlighted last time that we actually, to the, the, the real world is in between. And actually to make reaction occur, we need time. And if we talk about equilibrium condition, it means that we have enough time to reach these equilibrium conditions. So we introduced the role of time of chemical reactions. Time is needed to reach equilibrium conditions. And the, 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 in this sense, we can imagine a role of, let's say, a residence time of a particle at given temperature and pressure conditions. We have seen that the equilibrium conditions depends on temperature and pressure always on temperature, sometimes on pressure, depends on the, on the number of atoms that we have uh, on, among reactants and products. Uh, anyway, for a given pair of T and P, we, we, we obtain, if we have enough time, at that, at that temperature and pressure, we reach the equilibrium condition. So we have to evaluate if we have enough time. So this work can be done comparing the residence time of a particle in a region where we have given thermodynamic conditions and the time needed for the, for the reaction to reach what is close to uh, enough, close to the equilibrium condition that of course is something that will be asymptotically reached in theory. So of course, if the residence time is long enough, we have equilibrium. If the residence time is very short, no reaction can occur. So if the flow is very fast, it covers the whole length of the uh, thrust chamber and nozzle in a very short time, there is no time for reaction to occur. In this case, we have the limit of frozen flow. So we introduce our, let's say, characteristic times. I call them Tf and T uh, as the flow time and the chemical time. So if this is true, it means that we have that the available time is short and we have the case of frozen flow. In case we have the opposite, The residence time of the flow is very long compared to the chemical characteristic time. We can reach the equilibrium condition. Uh, 
But you see here that if we can in some way have an idea of this uh, of this fluid dynamic time of this flow time you you can understand that where the velocity is more that means at the convergence section this time will be longer the particle will spend more time in the convergence section because of its slow velocity the fluid particle will moves slowly and will spend a long time whereas when it's moving at very high speed there will be a short residence time and this is what happens in the diverging section typically so you can imagine already that this frozen flow condition is something that we can expect in the divergence section whereas this equilibrium condition is more likely in the combustion chamber and possibly in the subsonic part of the nozzle. Anyway, to make correctly this evaluation, we have to focus on this time here, this characteristic time of chemical process. So this chemical characteristic time is related to the process of the chemical, chemical reaction, but it's called the chemical reaction mechanism. Chemical reaction mechanism, we have seen an example last time of a reaction between hydrogen and fluorine. And what we have seen is that we have different reactions. Of course, there will be among these reactions, we have to focus on the role of the different of, of each of them. And in particular, there can be fast ones and slow ones. And of course, the characteristic time to reach the equilibrium will be governed by the slower reactions. But one can also estimate the importance of each reaction with respect to the heat released. And in this case, we should uh, evaluate which are the reaction where most of it release occur. So in general, uh, so this is what is called this chemical reaction mechanism. Uh, represents what is called the chemical kinetics. Mm. So wh what we uh, now we should uh, look at are uh, exactly these reactions and how they evolve in time. So we start by, we, we wrote the, the reaction equation as some um, Ui AI equal to zero. This is a reaction equation. What we used it, it when we talked about the equilibrium. Here, let's write this splitting. Here, this new as positive value among products and negative values for reactants. But we can also write it again, uh, splitting reactant products to have always positive new so that we can uh, better uh discuss the the single uh the elementary reaction of the mechanism i recall that the chemical reaction mechanism is represented by elementary reactions that re actually they represent some results of collisions among uh, atoms and mo molecules so we write this in this way emphasizing the, the stoichiometric coefficient of products and reactants. And we consider given number of reactions, M reactions that characterize our chemical mechanism. And for each of these M reactions, the J equal to one up to N, we can write the corresponding equilibrium constant that will be written with this coefficient as the product 
out pressure pressures of products raised to the power new IJP and the pressure pressure of reactants raised to the power new IJR. So, of course, this K is a function of temperature, and we have seen based on the minimization of the Gibbs free energy. Uh, well, we can try now to, um, to elaborate uh, this expression. Actually, we can consider that this AI here are all the species independently of the fact they are here and or here. And so we sum up to N, all the species, all the present species. And in this case, we see that the same species can ap appear in this expression with uh, this exponent. I mean, the new IJP on the uh, on the numerator here of, of KP expression and with new IJR at the denominator so that we can also write this as pi uh, equal one to N number of species PI over P0 to new IJP minus new IJR. <coughs> And we can make also appear as we did our <clears throat> uh, moral fractions xi. And here it will be, let, let me write this in this way, p over p0 to delta nu j multiplying the product i from 1 to n of our xi raised to the power new ij p minus new ij r. So where, of course, we have to uh, consider here that I write p xi, and we have p many times here, uh, in the product with the, this uh, difference of stoichiometric coefficient as exponent, and we have to sum it, uh, these exponents for i equal from 1 to n, and so this delta nu j, which is relevant to the j, j's reaction, will be the sum i equals 1 to n of nu i j p minus new ij r. Okay. So this is the equilibrium conditions for all these reactions. <clears throat> but uh, before reaching this equilibrium condition, there will be a, a, a progress of the reaction. So as we consider this as a dynamic equilibrium, we have formation of products and depletion of products to form reactants. We have this two-way process. But what, what matters is the overall balance. So at the end, when we reach equilibrium, there is no net production or depletion of species. Whereas before reaching equilibrium, there will be some net production or depletion of species. So we we'll like to, and we already introduced actually, this quantity sigma that represents the mass produced per unit volume and time of a given species. So it's uh, the net rate of production or depletion of species is sigma i, which is a function of temperature pressure and of where we are with respect to equilibrium, so the present composition of the mixture. 
<coughs> so to evaluate uh, this quantity, which is zero at equilibrium, because we have no net production depletion, we exploit the law of mass action. Sta parlando qualcuno? So the law of mass action states that the rate at which an ele elementary reaction proceeds, the rate at which an elementary reaction proceeds is proportional to the product of the molar concentration of the reactants, each raised to, the power, to a power equal to its stoichiometric coefficient in the reaction equation. So uh, we see that there is something similar to the equilibrium that, of course, is the, the final uh, condition of the process. What we see here is that we talk of molar concentrations and we consider a rate of progressing of an elementary reaction. And this rate is proportional to the product of the molar concentration of reactants raised to the their stoichiometric coefficient. And uh, so let's uh, first recall what is the molar concentration, is the number of moles per unit volume. We write this with the symbol uh, square brackets uh, about the, the name of the species. And this is given by the number of moles per unit volume. Of course, this is, will be related to the other way, way that we use to evaluate the e relative e distance. Si. Uh, uh, si si ha scritto Mi sente? Sì, si, è che forse si è buttato lo schermo perché penso che lei adesso abbia scritto qualcosa. Ma non lo vediamo. Ok, ora sì. Bene, grazie. So we have here we can make a peer different uh let's say we can relate this to y's and, and x of uh, a species of course to make our y appear we need masses and so we recall that this number of moles is the mass divided by the molar mass and then we can uh, define this quantity here we have defined this as the mass per unit volume of the given species which is the species density or the molar mass and this is also equal to rho y over m. Of course, we can also consider here that this is x uh, by n over v, uh, or we can also exploit here the fact that we have y over m for the species, as is also in this case, it can be also written as rho over the molar mass by xi. So this is the uh, molar uh, concentration of the species. And our rate will be, say, proportional to the product, if these are the reactants now, to the product of concentration of species to the power raised to the 
to a power equal to their stoichiometric coefficient. So I'm, from my considering the reaction J, I should consider a rate of reaction proportional to this. And similarly, I can consider also the reverse reaction and consider the, 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 the rate corresponding to the transformation of products in reactants. And this will be another rate, which is proportional to pi i equal 1 and p. So because what the law of mass action says is that if there is some reaction among molecules, this, this reaction will proceed proportionally to uh, the molar concentration of each participating species. And this can be seen for both the forward and backward reaction. So from reactants to products and from products to reactants, of course. We can also say that, in principle, the distinction of reaction and products will be based on our feeling, because actually we have species which are changing from, uh, let's say, a combination to another. So when we talk about the progress of reaction, so, so we, we are considering this rate. The, this rate represents how, how the reaction is progressing. So we, we already saw that there is a quantity, this is the process, progress of reaction, we call this psi. And this progress as dx psi. And the rate representing this advancement of the reaction, this progress of the reaction, will be something like a dx psi over dt. So how much is progressing this reaction? in time. And we, we can refer to what you already seen to say we have the xi greater than zero. We are progressing from reactants to, to, product, to, to product for this reaction here. We write here below in only one direction. And progressing this direction with this dx i, dx i, would there be that the number of uh, uh, moles of the first species, for instance, will change with this dx i in a proportion with respect to the other reactants, which is related to the stoichiometric coefficients. And similarly, there will be d and 2 r equal to minus nu 2 r the psi. And there will be also d and 1 p proportional to new 1p dx i. So overall, if we consider this, we can, we can see that our, the, the overall change that we have for the species N1 will be the sum of the changes on the side of reactants and on the side of products. And so if we take the stoichiometric coefficient, 
this will be proportional to the xi. So in general, there will be that our change of moles will be proportional to the difference of stoichiometric coefficient multiplying our the change, let's say, given by our progress variable. So the rate will be obtained considering the, the derivative of xi in time, the change of xi in time. So uh, what we said here is that here rate is proportional to. So we can consider that uh, our rate will be through a constant. We have a rate of reaction of the forward reaction for the J reaction will be proportional through a, with, a, with a, a coefficient Kfj to our product AUIJR, and we have also rate for the backward reaction, which is proportional to that product through this quantity here. So this rate is something related to this dx psi dt, and what we are looking is to something like this d and i dt. But uh, uh, what is usually done is to consider the number of moles per unit volume. So we have that these constants are adjusted such that we have change of concentration in this left-hand side. But of course, to pass from dx psi to DNI, we have to consider the stoichiometric coefficient too, as shown here. So you see that we have, in general, for the given species, the, the K species, and for the forward reaction, There will be this rate here. Multiplied by stoichiometric coefficient of the species K in the product and among reactants. <clears throat> and we can also uh, call this for the sake of uh, shortness rate Fj delta nu Kj. And similarly, you can write an expression for the backward reaction. And for the backward reaction, it would be I try to write it here so that we can see together. The change of Molar concentration in time of the species A K in for the J reaction 
the, the backward in the backward direction, it will be our rate here multiplied by again the uh, change of stoichiometric coefficient that will be in the backward direction, the same as seen here, but change of sign. Okay, because we are seeing the reverse reaction. And so, looking to this one and this one, we see that this species for, from that reaction is being produced by, in general, by forward and backward reaction. And the sum of these two contributions will, will give us the contribution of that reaction to the change of molar concentration of that species. So we have to sum the two contributions and get for the given reaction J this time we put together backward and forward reactions and we obtain that for we have to consider the species K reaction J the change of stoichiometric coefficients and then we have we can go back to the expression with Kf and Kb. Our rates are expressed in this way. New Ijr minus Kbj. KBJ pi I one to N molar concentration of the species to the power new IJ okay. So of course this is not the, the final value that you like to have to have a sigma because we have to consider the different reactions. And so we should sum also for the reaction for the species. Uh, and uh, the relation between this change of, this is the moles per unit volume, the sigma was the mass per unit volume and time. So we have to multiply by, let's say our sigma j will be the molar mass multiplying our d AI in the T. Mm. So this is for the species. Or if you prefer, we should keep a K for to have the same symbols. So it should be sigma KJ. Probably it's better if I write this way. MK DK DT. So this is the contribution for the change of that species. Uh, given by that reaction, and we should sum for all the reactions. And uh, at equilibrium condition, we have that the sigma is equal to zero. For this, for each reaction, we can comment on this, comparing this expression to, with what happens at equilibrium. If we are at equilibrium, this change will be in time will be zero. Our sigma j will be zero at equilibrium condition. And you see that in this case, it means that the terms in parentheses here, which is here, should be zero at equilibrium. And so we see that the con there is a relation between our Kf and Kb, so a coefficient for forward and backward reaction rates that would be that Kfj over Kpj 
if this is zero, this ratio will be the product i equal one to n is k over k b will be the product of molar concentration of products. divided by the products of AI to new IJR. That can be written in different ways, making appear also the more only the molar concentration and uh, in particular, we can use our delta that you used also before. And we write here pi i equal 1 to n, molar concentration to our delta nu ij. And uh, we exploit here the fact that our ai is equal to, we said before, rho m i y i or rho over m x i we use the latter one to make appear the molar fraction and uh, you see that this does not depend on i so will be uh, to uh, the raised to the power of the sum of this delta nu i j and the sum of delta nu i j is what we call Delta uh, delta nu j. So this will be rho over m delta nu j that multiplies by i one to n. Xi delta nu Ij. So you can recognize here the uh, yes, we can use the perfect gas equation of state rho over m is P over RT. And so we can we have rho over m here is p over rt. And so our kfj over kbj is p over rt to the power, we say, delta nu j that multiplies pi 1 to n xi delta nu ij and this is clearly kp over rt to delta nu j kpj of course So you see that there is a relation of these two uh, backward and forward coefficients to the equilibrium constant and uh, a function, a further function of temperature, but uh, a defined one. So we have that these two quantities are not independent of each other, and it's sufficient to know one of them to have the other. Questions? Uh, so uh, we have to determine one of them and what we can uh, see is what is found is that also kf for instance and as a consequence kb 
are functions, but are function of only temperature. And this is because they represent the actual mechanism of reaction, which is made by two, which is governed by two phenomena. Collisions, so the frequency of collision is important, but also the fact that these collisions have enough energy to make the reaction occur. So we have to represent, this, depend, this will depend, this energy means temperature, and we can represent this through the activation energy of Higgs reaction. So we have the well-known Arrhenius law that relates our K Grazie. And here the, the constant that we, we have will depend on the dimension we use for the activation energy. But the expression is of this kind, where we have this, this dependency here, temperature to a given uh, exponent, represents the frequency of collisions, is related to frequency of collisions, and this other term is related to activation energy. So actually it represents the number of molecules having enough energy. So this is, if they are very energetic, T goes to infinity, this means that all are effective, and so this exponential law becomes one. If temperature is low, this becomes the exponential to minus infinity, minus infinity, so it's zero. So this is something that goes from zero to one, and you see that we have, uh, uh, it represents what is the fraction of these collisions that will result in advancement of the reaction. So uh, what we can see by this term uh, is that the, the reaction rate will be increasing with temperature and uh, in both direction will increase with temperature. So we have to, and the reaction will progress if we see this expression, you know that here this is going to zero when we approach the equilibrium. So this change of the molar fraction will be higher when we are far from the equilibrium and it goes to zero when we approach the equilibrium condition. So uh, what we see here is that when these coefficients are larger at high temperature, the reaction will proceed faster towards equilibrium. So our characteristic time will be in some way related to these constants. It is not constant, these functions. At this function of temperature, and so there will be, this characteristic time will be shorter when we have higher case, that means higher temperatures. So before uh, stopping 10 minutes, I would like to uh, summarize uh, also uh, better to, let's show this one here. You see that here we have, as we changed from molar concentration to molar fraction here, we have seen that we have just substituted, we can do Similarly, for the, uh, in this expression, and you see that if I consider the molar fraction or the mass fraction, as shown in these two expressions, you see that I have in front a density. And this density will be here to multiply this 
product. And of course, the density for a given temperature will be proportional to pressure. And so you see that we have pressure to the stoichiometric coefficient multiplying the forward rate and the backward rate, telling us that the higher the pressure, the faster will be the reaction. And this is because it increases the probability of collisions. So we make uh, a 10 minute break now and we will uh, resume at 1.15. Sì. Sì, 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 okay. sì, sì, quella pressione è in alto. Zero delta Vj aggiunto. Sì, sì. Sì, vabbè, come dire, quella è l'unità di misura poi alla fine. Per cui è equivalente a dire che la pressione è in atmosfera. Grazie. Sì. Cioè, che... perché mi chiedono dove devo iniziare l'8 perché ho fatto la fascia oraria e posso scrivere anche io sì. scrivo qui che c'è il mio punto
la produzione comunque è un dato assolutamente di confermare la presenza, non compare il quello da breve. Allora, vediamo se me lo segnare qui a tutti quanti, perché ho sbagliato il numero o no? Non ho sbagliato il numero, anche perché poi non so se riesco a dare la presenza vostra. Scrivetelo di qua, devo stare tra parte di questo foglietto prezioso. assegnare la presenza Continue here and yes, we see in this expression once we have a pressure to power delta nu, and you see that here, uh, because of, of how the backward and forward direction are made. For instance, in a, a dissociation recombination reaction, you will find that we have a P squared for the recombination, recombination and a P linear for uh, the dissociation. So you see that, for instance, from here, that the effect of pressure is to accelerate the recombination reaction compared to the dissociation reactions. So once we have got this information about the reaction mechanism, we have now to, to see what happens in our one dimension, one dimensional expansion model. So you recall we have our control volume dx. And we, we have seen there uh, that we can define pressure, density, temp temperature, velocity, enthalpy, and now also the, something related to the composition of the mixture that in principle can change. So we can consider some yi, for instance, rho, p, t, yi, etc., or directly pi or rho i if we prefer. And there will be the enthalpy, the enthalpy of the species, and so on. So what will be the governing equations? Some principle continue, or the general principle continue to be valid. So we have to consider that a steady state, we have mass conservation, momentum bar force balances, and energy conservation. So we can say that If we don't consider any heat addition, mass addition, and work, and friction, we are in the case similar to what we have seen for the isentropic nozzle in the previous classes. Here, what we should consider is that our dm dot, at the continuity equation, is zero, that now this th0 is equal to zero, but here, here, our h now, the enthalpy, is the absolute enthalpy of the mixture. And consider that here we are always considering the mass specific values. And for the balance of forces and momentum, we still can obtain rho u du plus dp equal to zero. We have to be careful here on how handling these equations 
because we are in principle changing the, the composition. And so, for instance, when we say P equal to rho R T, we have to be careful and consider that this R is changing. So we can recall that R is, of course, R over the molar mass of the mixer, and this will be related to the molar mass of each species. Something like this, our R is sum of the gas constant of each species multiplied by the corresponding mass fraction. And so we have that, for instance, this becomes so that you see that we also have the mass fraction that is changing and is changing this equation of state. And as I mentioned, we have to consider the absolute enthalpy. Uh, that is, of course, we have that the mixture enthalpy is the sum of the contribution of each species weighted by the mass fraction. And our HI will be the integral from t0 to t. This is the sensible enthalpy, CPI dt, plus delta H phi zero. And of course, the total value will include H zero will be H plus the square the half. So where the, the, the our sigma that we have seen before the production appear is that we have to consider a, a mass equation for each species where we can have a change of the amount of each species because of reactions. So we can, and this continuity equation can be split in different equations where we consider, we know that dot M is for UA but we can also consider the mass flow rate of given species, which is dot mi, with partial density, velocity, and cross-sectional area. And this is, of course, also equal to y by dot m. And so our sigma is related to our DMI, because this is the change, we have to consider a control volume, and this is the change of mass in time of the given species. Our sigma is the change of mass in time per unit volume. So if we consider this elementary volume, we should multiply our sigma by the volume and obtain our DMI. This is an elementary volume, which is ADX. So you see where this sigma appear. Uh, and allow us to change the values of y, because we see here that dot m is constant, and so the mi d dot m i is equal to d dot m y i. This is constant, and so it becomes dot m dy i. 
So you see that we have a relation that allows us to express our dyi as sigma a over dot m dx. Okay, so we have this additional uh, equation to be considered to change our mass fractions. We have the, the above equation, which are the same as before with uh, the, the warnings that I mentioned, and this one more. So for, uh, in case of frozen flow, we have that this dy is zero, in case of equilibrium flow, we have that the sum of gi dy is equal to zero. So what we will not solve these equations. Uh, of course, we have no straightforward solution in case of non-equilibrium, but we like to make some considerations. And one of the reasons why uh, we cannot do, uh, actually we didn't solve it for the equilibrium condition either. So we, we need to make some comments. And uh, what we can say here is that to get our set of equation that we solve for the real nozzle, we uh, worked on this expression, introducing the speed of sound. And uh, now, and you recall that speed of sound is gamma RT in ideal gas, the square root of gamma RT. And uh, well, we have something that is not clear in this case. And when I say a equals square root of gamma t is still valid here. And the reason of this question is that we have here gamma, we have here r. And we have species that are changing. So this gamma will be a ratio of specifically the constant pressure and constant volume and specific heat of the mixture will be the sum of the contributions of its species. And so it's better to, to have a look on it. So to have a look on the definition of the speed of sound in case of reacting flows, and in particular coming from the definition of the specific heats also in case of reacting flows. We have seen for the CP this definition is the change of enthalpy in time, uh, sorry, with temperature for a given, at a given pressure. So let's look to what happens for a mixer. This H now is the sum of yi hi. So we have that H is sum yi hsi, sensible entropy plus formation entropy. So what we know is that the HSI is equal to CPI dt. So we know that for each species, what we have seen for the single species before is still valid. And so there is a direct relation between the CP and the change of entropy exactly as if these species were alone. 
so when we consider now the, the change of this enthalpy here, we should consider that we have this dH will be, of course, the sum of HSI plus delta HFI zero dy plus if I differentiate the term in parentheses, we have just the HSI, so it becomes some YICPI dt. <clears throat> right? So you see, in case of frozen flow, it's something very similar to what happens for a single species. We have just to cancel this term, and you have some yi cpi dt. And so we can define a cp of the mixture like this. And we have that dh, let's say frozen, will be equal to cp frozen dt. But you see that, for instance, in equilibrium conditions, in general, we have some reaction. We have we should consider also this other term. So, if we consider, of course, if we have a reaction, this will we, we don't have a general uh, definition of a CP for that mixture because it will depend on the process on time. On a different uh, uh, comment can be made in case of equilibrium conditions, because in that case, actually we have that our mass fractions will be will depend on pressure and temperature. The equilibrium composition is a function of temperature and pressure. So in this case, if we consider our CP, this is obtained by dH over dt at constant pressure, we can say that our Ys in the equilibrium condition are only depending on temperature because I'm considering now the change at constant pressure. And so this can be expressed as dy dt by dt, this dy, because it's only, as I said, a function of temperature. So beside this, let's say this CP frozen that I have defined here as dH over dt at constant pressure and at constant composition, we have, we can define also an equilibrium CP that will be dH dt at constant temperature, uh, constant pressure. And because composition now is a function of, because we know that yi is yi tp. So if I consider this expression on the line in yellow, we can say, and we see here the, the CP frozen. We can say that CP not equilibrium condition will be equal to the frozen CP plus the sum of HSI plus delta H Fi zero dy dt at constant pressure. So you see that we have an additional third that can lead to values of Cp which are quite different from the frozen one. So I wouldn't say we should uh, 
I wouldn't talk much about the value of these different values of CP, but it's important to know that there are different values. And they, and, uh, they of course, can be used, provided that we know uh, what is the meaning of the specific heat we are using. So a similar uh, discussion can be made, of course, for the internal energy. That can be expressed as a function of the absolute enthalpy. We have the absolute internal energy, which is directly related to it. And we have also the, that E is equal to the sum yi yi. And we can write that our internal energy will be the enthalpy minus R I T minus T zero. And this will be, so I have the CP minus R, which is our CV. Yes, and if I have not made error, it should be. Minus a right is zero. This will be RT. Sorry, I have to remove this term from this expression. Hmm. So now it's correct. So once we have this expression, you see that is quite similar to what we had for the uh, internal. Uh, sorry, for the enthalpy. The only difference is this RT and the fact that we are using CV rather than CP. Uh, and so at frozen condition, we have that CV frozen will be equal to the EDT at constant volume and uh, uh, Y. And this will be the sum of Y CVI. Whereas if I'm considering, I'm moving now to this expression, right? If Yi is constant, I can proceed with constant values of Y. And so it's just as in the general case. Whereas in case of equilibrium, We have again that y is a function of temperature, so Cv frozen plus, and compare with this one on top of the board, ESI plus delta HFI zero. Dy dt has constant volume. So you see that it's quite similar, the expression for CB compared to what we have seen for the CP. So you see that if I consider a gamma for the equilibrium condition, it's no longer so straightforward and simple as we have seen for, as, as we can see for uh, frozen flow. We are considering the equilibrium condition because we have, we can express this. We have a state of equilibrium which depends on, only on thermodynamic variables and not on the process. 
But this helps us also to consider what will happen in case of non-equilibrium flows. So once we have defined our frozen and equilibrium specific heat, which are different from each other, we can go back and try to understand how this will affect the speed of sound. So the speed of sound is interesting because we, 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 are, we saw and we commented saying that we have Mach number equal to one at trot. That means that we have that velocity is equal to the sonic speed. So it's at least interesting to see if there is something to do or to analyze about the speed of sound. Speed of sound is defined as dp zero at constant entropy. This is the defini definition is based on wave propagation of waves, is on the propagation of waves of infinitesimal strength. And we have seen that uh, this A is related to CP and CB through our gamma. Now, <clears throat> let's try to, uh, to see something more and to have relations for our CP and CB at equilibrium conditions and to exploit them to for a, a, a new relation for the speed of sound. Let's try to, to, to do it. And we, we say that the H is equal to the HDT, the partial derivatives, the HDT at constant pressure DT, plus, in general, dH dP T dP. <clears throat> I'm writing this because <clears throat> we have that our dH, in general, is the sum Yi CPI dT plus HSI dy. So I write this in this way because the, in general, our y's will all, also depend on p. So we should consider here in this dhdp, there is the fact that in principle, our y, unless we are at equilibrium condition, will also depend on, on pressure. So the dependent part, part depending on temperature is the equilibrium one. And then we have the term of derivative at constant temperature for the change of the entropy. So similarly for the internal energy, A similar expression. So comparing with this and with the similar expression for the internal energy, we see that our dHdp temperature, constant temperature is the sum of 
of HSI plus delta HFI zero dyi dp at constant temperature. This is this term, as I mentioned before. And similarly, we can obtain the same similar expression for d dvt. So let's go back on our A. <clears throat> and uh, here, we can write this as dp over dv, dv over d rho. And this V dv over d rho is, of course, V is 1 over rho, so it's minus 1 over rho squared. So this is another way of writing our A. So we should look now to express A. We should consider the constant entropy process. And uh, well, what we do here, we see that TDS is equal to DE plus PDV or DH minus VDP. And uh, we substitute here the expression we got for dH and dE. So go back, dH is this one, and dE is this one. So let's substitute and see that for the isentropic process, means that this is zero. So dE plus PdV is equal to zero. That means CB equilibrium dT plus dE dV T. plus PdV. Uh, this is the, there's something missing here. dP and dV. Oh, the other one will be dH, and so dH is CP, dT plus dH, dP, T, dP, minus V, dP, equal to zero. So, looking to CP over CV, just to compare with our, uh, say this could, could be our gamma, we can obtain CP and CV from this expression and we have dt in both cases, so we have just to write uh, what we see here is p is minus p plus the dv. And cp is equal to V minus dH dP T. Okay, I can take this expression in, in this one with CP over CV, and we see that we here there will appear uh, we can express, we are considering isentropic 
uh, transformation because we are looking for the speed of sound that is obtained at constant entropy. So dV could be also expressed as dV dP by dP at constant entropy or vice versa for the pressure. So we can say that dP is equal to, for our process, dP dV at constant entropy by dV. And so doing this, we see that we can simplify and we obtain, and this is equal to V minus dH over dP at constant temperature over P plus dE over dV at constant temperature that multiplies dP over dV at constant entropy. <clears throat> so if you look here, you see that, sorry, this is a squared. So you see that we have dP dV at constant entropy here, which is exactly rho squared is squared. So with this minus in front too. So this expression can be written as rho squared is squared V minus dH over dP constant temperature over P plus D dV. So we can uh, now also make a couple of further steps to to see that we it will result that DCP over CV is equal to Let's write it here. It's equal to uh, minus rho, rho a squared, uh, rho squared a squared, sorry. Rho squared a squared by dB dPt. We can uh, <clears throat> this is the PDBT, and this is the result of a simplification of this term that we can uh, see as we have that V minus DHDP can be written as, I mean, this term here can be written and write it here is uh, V minus V E V V dp minus dpv dp t. And this is because, of course, h is c plus pv. So if I put e plus pv here, I have ddp that can be written as dE over dV by dV over dP here. And uh, then I have the term PV that is derived with respect to pressure, constant temperature. So here, of course, this is a constant temperature. So uh, 
we can see yes constant temperature this is v then i have this term and then i have to derive constant temperature this term and this will become uh, minus v because if i derive with respect to 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 b i have p sorry i have to derive respect to p so we have v dp dp which is of course one and then i have the other term which is minus uh, p dv dp a constant temperature so you see that we have a v here another v here that simplify and uh, so what is left here I can simplify with this one if it's clear probably and we have that the left terms will be this one and this one and you see that I can consider our dvdp with respect to t and I have d dv and p exactly like in the denominator and so I can simplify once simplified we have this expression let's call it gamma and i have gamma equal to minus rho squared the square dp dv t I have gamma equal to minus rho squared squared dv dpt or a squared will be equal to minus gamma over rho squared one over dv dpt that we will refer to as a new gamma is gamma s by p over rho because we, we know that we like to have something like gamma p over rho in the frozen case is what we have and here this gamma s will be minus gamma 1 over p rho 1 over dv dp t or minus finally minus gamma and this derivative of logarithm of, logarithm of, v, of v over logarithm of p at a given temperature so you see that we have something which is different and that's to take into account also the change of volume with pressure at constant temperature to uh, have an expression related to what we already know for the frozen flow. So if we go back, so we have to consider this and uh, we can ask to the meaning now of the of course the, the only quantity that has a physical meaning we can always define a, a local frozen speed of sound but the only one that you have uh, physical meaning in, in case of equilibrium flow is this is this one is this a equilibrium so if i define a frozen a frozen square as gamma p over rho and this is gamma frozen it's a quantity that can be convenient but has no physical meaning and uh, an interesting comment can be made now if we consider 
that this quantity, we recall that we have defined this from dP over the rho at constant entropy. And why did this the physical one? Because of the propagation of waves. And if we consider this, and we consider an isentropic process like the equilibrium flow, we still have that dP is A squared d rho on in this isentropic flow. And if this is true, this allows us to write again by the, in the momentum equation that, uh, of course, is our rho u du, <laughs> dp rho u du. So we can write this as A squared d rho, our dp plus rho u du equal to zero. And uh, so we can write also that there from this, the rho over rho is equal to minus one squared u the u, and we can substitute in the continuity equation this is the rho over rho plus the u over u plus the a over a equal to zero. This is a continuity equation. And so here you can see that if I uh, multiply here by u, you see that I'm multiplying this quantity, one minus u squared over a squared, uh, Is it correct? Uh, one minus u squared over a squared the u over u equal to minus d a over a. So this is the Mach number here. And you see that considering this equilibrium speed of sound, we still find the uh, condition, the sonic condition, when dA is equal to zero. So we have still choking a trot. So I will stop here today. And what we have now to, to, to say is that in case of isentropic flow, we still can use our uh, tables and evaluate the conditions at trot Whereas in case of non-isentropic flow, that means if we have reaction, we cannot say we need the formal integration and we cannot say that sonic condition occurred exactly at short. So it's something uh, different. But as, as long as the flow is isentropic, that means frozen or equilibrium flow, we have something similar at least in terms of choking conditions. But we will see also through the, some exercises the differences that we have in the two cases.